All righty. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Matt Woods. I'm the Chief Data Scientist here at Amazon Web Services. That basically means that I get to talk to smart people such as yourselves about how you're using data and then take all of your feedback and roll that into our product roadmap uh, back in Seattle at Amazon headquarters. Um, now, I have to be open and honest with you that you have been brought here under false pretenses. I am here to ask for your help as much as you are to hear about some of the awesome applications that our customers are working on uh, using open data. And so I'm just gonna get that out in front right now. If you have data sets, particularly open data sets that you think other people would find useful, please drop me an email, matthew at amazon.com. You can all write that down now, I, I'll pause for a bit. So matthew at amazon.com, if you have open data that you think other people can benefit from, uh, we operate an open data, pro open data program and uh, we would love to host your data and have more people interacting with it, help others build tools around that data so that you can use that data to uh, build the sort of awesome applications that we're gonna, gonna hear today. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how our customers are using data in general. Uh, I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit and introduce uh, um, the Common Crawl, uh, which is a data set that we host under the public data set program. And then I'm gonna introduce uh, Ravi, who's gonna talk a little bit about Globus Online, uh, which is a tool for moving data in and out of the cloud. So, my background is very much in data. Before I worked at Amazon, uh, I was the head of production software at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, uh, where I worked on building out the next generation DNA sequencing pipeline. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, uh, the uh, original human genome uh, took about uh, a decade, about 13 years, and several billion dollars to sequence. This was a quest to sequence every individual base of the entire human genome, three billion bases. Now, you're all data people, so you're thinking three billion bases, no big deal. Uh, but that took a, a remarkably a large number of people a remarkably long time to sequence. It's very, very labor intensive. The ultimately, uh, ultimate resulting data was actually relatively small. It's only about three gig of data uh, that goes inside a, a full human genome. There was a quantum leap uh, probably about six years ago now, uh, which was the arrival of uh, next generation DNA sequencing technologies, which allowed us to sequence uh, genomes not in decade time spans, but in week and month time spans. And not for billions of dollars, uh, but tens of thousands and now a thousands of dollars. And once that drops beneath about a thousand dollars, that's the point at which uh, it becomes uh, economical to start having genomes screened as part of regular healthcare uh, uh, pro provision. The flip side of being able to sequence all that data is that you have to generate, that it, the, you actually gen, end up generating a huge amount of data. Uh, so when uh, I came to join Amazon from, from the Sanger Institute, uh, we're generating around 250 terabytes each and every week. Now that's a challenging amount of data to move around uh, internally. Uh, it's a very challenging amount of data to, to operate with. It's a very challenging amount of data to process. And so I'm probably familiar with some of the very large data challenges uh, that some of our customers are facing. But that's not the biggest problem of data. It's not the biggest problem with data sets. It's the, the size of the original data set isn't the biggest problem. Uh, the lots of data isn't really the, the, the core of the problem. The problem is that there's a multiplication effect when you start working with data sets of, uh, of, of any size, basically. And particularly when you start integrating data sets across multiple, uh, across multiple locations and multiple uh, uh, use cases. And that's that you end up with lots of data that has lots of uses. Data which is useful will end up having lots of uses. And things that have a lot of uses will end up having a lot of users. And if you have a lot of users, then you're gonna end up having to uh, process and access that data from lots of locations. And these end up being force multipliers uh, in the uh, complexity of managing and handling the data uh, that you're working with. Uh, the ultimate force multiplier, of course, is cost. You wanna be able to do that for as small a price as possible. So all of these are force multipliers in terms of uh, the complexity of managing data, the complexity of storing data, and particularly the complexity of making data available uh, to people that might want to take advantage of it. Uh, so um, uh, the complexity is, is significant. So one of the data sets that we house, in addition to the common crawl, which we'll hear about in a minute, on the uh, Amazon Public Datasets program, uh, is the 1,000 genome data. Uh, this is a very large data set. It's the world's largest collection of human variation. It's 200 terabytes in size. And managing the complexity of the 200 terabytes, uh, even if you're a significant PI in a large university, is gonna be very, very challenging. It's gonna be very complex. You have to be able to ask for the storage that you need to be able to store those 200 terabytes. You have to be able to ask then for the compute that you're gonna need on premise to be able to access that data and work with it in a way which allows you to try and derive some value from it. So the complexity is what kills you. And what we've seen from customers, uh, large and small, 
is that the cloud and AWS, whether it's a public data sets program or um, uh, privately housed data, is that the, house, the cloud is becoming the canonical source of the data. Way back when, with the original human genome, uh, we were able to put those three gigabytes on a, an MP3 drive and just ship them around the place in a jiffy bag. Um, it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, high latency, but it's got good bandwidth. Uh, and we still do that today uh, to some degree here at Amazon. But what we've seen is that you, you could, at that point, at the gigabyte level, you can start moving your storage to where your compute is. Even in a large supercomputing facility, you can take your data and load it onto all the uh, individual nodes on your cluster, and then you can start processing against it. When you're dealing with 100 terabyte, 200 terabyte data sets and larger, uh, a petabyte, we have customers at petabyte scale. When you start working at that sort of level, the benefit of moving the storage to the compute uh, is completely removed. And so what we found is that customers are creating canonical sources of their data set in S3, on the web, on, on EBS, and then bringing the compute alongside it. And this is really what uh, started us thinking that we might um, want to provide some of these common data sets that we were seeing a lot of customers going to the, uh, going to the effort of uploading for their, own, uh, for their own uses and to make available to other people. And that's what uh, basically led us to, uh, to create the public data sets program and make that data available as a canonical source in as many ways as possible. And with the, the 1,000 genome data set, we're actually hooked into the NIH uh, production pipeline. So once a week, that data will be uploaded to, and updated uh, onto S3 in exactly the same way as it's pushed out to all the other sources. So what you end up is the, with the uh, opportunity of taking advantage of utility infrastructure uh, so you, to make available the data that you're working with. By having a canonical source that you can attach up the compute uh, to, you can basically make not only the data available, but you can make the computation available to anybody that has an AWS account. So this fosters a remarkable amount of, uh, of collaboration. And we've seen this with open data. We've also seen this with, uh, with, uh, with closed internal data sets. Again, using the genomic space as an example, uh, the people that make the sequences uh, now stream the data from those sequences directly up to S3. And then they have a data space, effectively, of tools around that data, uh, which uh, partners and other people can provide to the data and to their customers. Uh, so you get, the, uh, you get the idea that you can foster a remarkable amount of collaboration as a remarkable opportunity for tools developers to be able to add value to the data sets that are already up there. It's also critical for reproducibility. So in scientific research, the concept of reproducibility is really at the core of what we're trying to do. The goal of writing a paper and getting it published is so that you can, well, today it's so you can get more funding. But the original goal is that you can pull it down and reproduce what somebody else has done so you don't have to go to the effort of creating that information yourself. And then you can build on top of it going forwards. Uh, we've lost a lot of that with traditional on-premise infrastructure. As scientific research has been uh, uh, becoming more and more computationally demanding, uh, we've lost a lot of that opportunity for reproducibility governed by the fact that the data sets are getting larger, the complexity of the processing pipelines is increasing all the time, and these multiplier effects means that it's very, very difficult to be able to resolve all the dependencies and build out exactly the same environment uh, that your uh, collaborators may be built even down the road or that have been provided in a scientific paper. If you start providing data in a canonical source up in the cloud, and as I say, if it's open, we'll host it for you, uh, if you can provide that, that's a very good starting point. That's a good crystallization point for future research. If you then start adding out the code and the pipeline that works with that data, now you've got a reproducible environment because we have a programmable infrastructure. So you can take your CloudFormation template, you can take your provisioning scripts, place it all under version control, and give that to your collaborators. Now they're not working with trying to resolve the dependencies and compile the binaries and figure out which flags you used to get the results that you need. They're working with the exact environment that you were working with. So reproducibility is uh, dramatically enhanced. And what I hope to see is that this is going to be significant in accelerating the rate of scientific research that we're seeing. It also benefits reuse. Uh, so reproducibility is one thing, but the sort of corollary to that is that you have a reusable environment, that the tools that you're building, if they are data intensive or data driven, can be much more easily reused when you're built on a utility environment. And to be able to remix the components of those tools, either remix the data or remix the code for processing the data. Which brings me on to the opportunity of open data and the opportunity of taking data uh, and making it available to other people uh, so that they can reproduce, reuse, and remix. So if you're interested in, uh, in, in contributing to this, I would love to talk to you. 
Uh, we have some fantastic data sets up here uh, on aws.amazon.com slash data sets. Uh, we, um, we have the common crawl. Uh, we have the 1,000 genome data set. We have a, the million song data set, which is a collection of million, uh, million different songs and artists and song metadata. Uh, we have the whole of the ensemble data set. We have triplet stores and everything else that you can possibly imagine. So if you're interested in working with open data, this is a great resource to get started. Uh, if you're interested in and you have data as a data producer, then please get in touch. I'm Matthew at Amazon.com. And with that, I would like to uh, welcome up Lisa Green, who's going to talk uh, a little bit about the Common Crawl. Lisa, thank you. Uh, so my name's Lisa, and I'm the director of the Common Crawl Foundation. Common Crawl builds and maintains an open repository of web crawl data. So common, like the commons, no intellectual property restrictions, and crawl, web crawler. I love my job. I'm really passionate about the work I do, and everybody on the team is. And that comes from two beliefs. One, that the web is the greatest data set of all time. I mean, it's huge, first of all. And second of all, it touches on every aspect of human society. S health, science, business, family. So we think that the web is the greatest data set of all time. And the second belief that makes me so passionate about my work is that everyone should have access to this data. It's not fair that the only people who have access to it are employees of a few large search engines, right? So we collect this data and we store it on S3 so that everyone can access it and compute against it. And that's why Amazon is such a crucial part of our, fulfilling our mission. We store our data on S3 and the public data sets that Matt was talking about, but it's not enough to just have access. If you have access but you can't run a job against it, it might as well be in a silo. So having the ability to use EC2 tools to run jobs against this data allows us to really fulfill the mission of letting everyone utilize this tremendous resource, web data. Um, Matt, can you click? Oh, thanks. So here are just a, uh, nope, there we go. Here's a few facts about it. It's about 8 billion web pages. Total is about 120 terabytes, and we've been doing this since 2008. And the formats that we have include ARC files, JSON metadata files, and plain text files. And like I said, it's available to anyone on Amazon's public data sets. If you want to know more about the formats, go to our website, commoncrawl.org. Go to our public data set page. On the URL that Matt showed, you'll be able to search through the public data sets and you can find Common Crawl. And from there, you can get to our wiki. It has more details about the for file formats, example code, advice about how to use it, some things that other people have done. So when, I first, when Matt first gave me the opportunity to come here and talk to everyone, I was really excited, and I had planned on standing up here and telling you about other people's projects, telling you some of the things that other people have done with the Common Crawl data, and talking about other people's code. But then one day, I was talking to Matthew uh, from Lucky Oyster, and he is so excited about Common Crawl use, and he has such the use case that we're trying to enable. I said before that we don't think it's fair that people in large search com engine companies have access to this type of data, but your everyday developer doesn't. Well, Matthew is a computer scientist that started playing with common crawl data out of personal curiosity, but then actually wove his findings into his new startup. And that's exactly what we're hoping to enable. So I'm going to let you hear it straight from the horse's mouth, and Matthew's going to talk about the code and the work that he's done with the common crawl data. Matthew? Hi, I'm Matthew Burke, uh, founder, CEO, CTO, janitor, <laughs> accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, and so on for Lucky Oyster. Uh, as Lisa said, I'm super enthusiastic about anyone having access to the web. Uh, and that, as she mentioned, has effectively turned into a new business for me. So we're funded, we've hired employee number one, and we were able, using the data, to formulate not just a hypothesis, but to test that and to roll it into a whole bunch of product ideas that we think have some muscle. And so that's kind of what we're working on. Um, so I'm going to take you through a bit of that. Anyone here ever try and crawl the web? Anyone? <laughs> All right. So the web is the greatest data set in the world. The problem is that you can't iterate over it. If you could iterate over it, we wouldn't really have a problem. 
you can iterate over small portions of it using things like sitemaps or traversing links, but in bulk, you simply cannot do that. So it's kind of an irony that the greatest data set in the world is completely inaccessible to Lisa's point. If you're sitting at Yahoo or Google or a large university, you might be able to have access to part of that, but it's super cost intensive and resource intensive to iterate over the web. And effectively, the Common Crawl Foundation does that for you. They provide it through S3, you pull the ARC files from S3, and you can uh, compute on it from there. But we did an experiment. We actually did two versions of the experiment. In the second one, I'm going to describe basically what we got for 100 bucks. So it's not just that the data is available, but the tools are now available for anybody, even a lone guy with a wacky idea or two, to get their hands on the data and to effectively apply compute resource to it to validate a hypothesis or formulate a new product. I think the other thing about uh, crawling the web that's sort of interesting is um, a lot of it is highly structured. And so decomposing the web, uh, also kind of deconstructing it requires a whole bunch of resource that I think about 10 years ago I started fantasizing about what it would mean to have a collection of a billion web pages. So to do the crawl, to have the collection, to store and persist the collection, and then to iterate over it. And I never got beyond thinking about how to store it because the cost of storage were so high. Um, so for those who have actually tried to crawl sections of the web or large portions of it, the other thing that you'll know is that <clears throat> while web search technology has come very, very far, what hasn't come very far is how to actually work with the data. So the spec, the ARC file spec, it's still available in this sort of antiquated file format with headers and sections and it's streamed and compressed. The spec for that was written, correct me if I'm wrong, in 1994. And the bulk of research around traversing the web and making it uh, iterable was really done in the late 90s, and there hasn't been a lot done since. So with a little bit of horsepower and using AWS spot, uh, spot instances in particular, you can actually go through it. So we start out with a pretty simple experiment. Uh, my hypothesis was that the web was not the best and ultimate and future repository of human activity, as we once thought it would be, and that social would be that repository. Uh, and so I, I thought about two things. Number one is that the locus of that data is changing. It's shifting from the open web, which we barely have access to, but through efforts like this we can, to the sort of social graph, which we cannot read today. So there are no efforts to give access, access to that. You can iterate over very, very tiny portions of it. So the locus of activity is changing, but also the nature of activity is changing as well. Because of how we interact socially, what we find on the web today is not only it references into the social graph, but it's highly structured. And so what you get today is highly structured data on web pages that you never really had before. Representations of things on pages you never had before, like hikes and runs and recipes and what songs we're listening to. And that's available on the open web as sort of an artifact of all the social work we do through other networks. So to do this, we really use the horsepower of AWS. In the very first experiment, we operated on about 1.2 billion pages worth of data. We used the on-demand instances, more or less the same configuration, as you'll see in a second. Uh, and for about $500, we processed that 1.2 or 1.3 billion pages. And I thought, wow, that's really great. That's utility computing, and it makes it affordable. A guy can write a check or use his credit card and can actually get some findings out of that. In the second version, we went through this three plus billion pages and the cost actually went down. So a couple of code tweaks, uh, the pages went up threefold, the cost went down fivefold to 100 bucks, and in order to do that, we leveraged spot instances. So spot instances, for those who don't really know it, um, you basically bid on unused capacity. So when I think about the cost of computing uh, resources or material in a previous job where I worked for a public company, we had to operate at a very low ratio of uh, sort of resource utilization. And so what that meant is we had thousands and thousands of servers, but generally we kept capacity across all types of resource at about 40%. And we would have spikes that would take us up to like 50, 60, 70%. Uh, but generally when I thought about computing cost, bless you, what I actually thought about was the unused cost of all of that iron sitting in our data centers, the power 
it was the cooling, it was the real estate, it was the servers that weren't being used. When you bid for unused capacity, effectively not just uh, your costs go down, but uh, you're sort of acting uh, in a more green, I believe, responsible way. And so we moved to spot instances and we had a very simple architecture. So a lot of people, when they look at large data sets, they like using the MapReduce model. There's Elastic MapReduce. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to reduce the exercise to its simplest possible component. So it's one operation. That operation is an extract. That data gets moved on in pipeline fashion, and then we do an indexing. So we have a master, and the master basically coordinates what data needs to be extracted. So what S3 paths actually get routed to the worker nodes. And then the master also collects data as the worker nodes do their work and do their extraction. The worker nodes wake up. And in order to use spot instances, you have to have nodes that are resilient to interruption. What that means effectively is creating an AMI where when the little worker wakes up, it says, mm, I know where the queue is. Let me pull work from the queue. Let me do my extraction and let me forward the extracted data over to the master. Master then receives it, stores it, persists it, and then does a whole bunch of indexing. And the output uh, is for us a whole bunch of things. Um, so at the end, I'll pop up a slide, some of the original findings, but we've gotten a lot deeper since then. But the output for us is a couple of other things. Number one, it's a, a super cost-effective way for us to, as I said, iterate through the web without being at a large institution. And this is some of the advantage that's underwritten. I think if Amazon had their way, we might be spending uh, not 100, maybe 1,000, maybe 10,000, maybe $100,000. And a couple of years ago, it would have cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars to do what I'm doing today for very, very little. Um, the other artifact of what, we, what we've done here is sort of a reusable framework. So we can modify the extraction, we can modify the post-processing, we can modify the indexing, and we can simply change the worker nodes, repopulate the queue on the master, and then fire up the worker nodes. We fire them up, they read through, when the queue is empty, we're done, and we have our output. So the second artifact is that we have a reusable framework. We simply tweak the code and we can go again at any time. And the third bit, um, when I do data mining, I typically do it through indexes and basically a reuse of search technology upside down. And so we've built these indexes of the extracted metadata. This is the entity metadata we found from across the web. It's on the order of about 400 million entities. And so we're able to slice and dice that and search through it and look at the distribution of tags and facets and attributes. And that's a huge asset for us to play with. Um, well, we went ahead very far. We're going to show you one of the outputs of the study. So that was the original one. Um, and if you look at the Lucky Oyster blog, it'll point you to our write-up of the first study and the second study. We have a third one underway. And we want to take the code that we've used for this very simple framework and promote it up to GitHub so other people can use it as well. The other thing that's kind of neat about uh, what we did in the beginning is that <clears throat> I time boxed it. And so I started using Hadoop. And I really gave myself a couple of days. And taking the EMR approach would have taken a much longer investment of time. And again, I wanted to keep things simple, simple architecture, reusable, reproducible, not get lost in configuration. And effectively, I wanted from scratch. Now, most of the time, that's not a great way to do this. but. For our approach, given two days, writing code from scratch with a very simple queue and worker nodes was the best way to do it. And that was kind of the approach that we took. Most people won't take that. But for us, if it's reusable, it's, uh, uh, we'll be very, very happy. And this, these are some of the findings. Again, the other key output for us is a set of indexes that we can use to look at the extracted data. And that's hugely valuable. Um, go to blog.luckyoyster.com. You can see the write-ups. And if we have time for questions, uh, if anyone has questions. Yeah. Yeah, I th so the question was the sort of veracity of data that you export through a data provider. And uh, Matt was talking about this before. Uh, S3 is effectively becoming a canonical locus for this data. And so when it comes to the web, really, in terms of its veracity or its 
Uh, for me, it's really the utility. Is it actually coming from the web? And that's pretty simple. I have two options. I can either go with uh, an open data set, which is what I've done with Common Crawl on the foundation, or I can do it myself. And so if I do it myself, I, I, may, um, I may be able to control how deep I go or what links I follow or don't follow. The problem is that it's so, even today, with spot instances and utility computing, it's so expensive to traverse the web to make it iteratable. Um, and that is kind of prohibitive. In terms of other data sets, what I'd like to see, so there are some others that are out there, like Freebase from MetaWeb. Um, that's out there and available. The, uh, and there are a ton. If you go and you look at the open data sets, there are a lot. And as I said, making, making S3 or those data sets sort of the output of your pipeline when you're pulling the data makes it effectively canonical. And I think that's where you sort of build up the trust. Yeah. It does, Lisa. So the question was, how current is the crawl data? Uh, we crawl about once a year right now. We're hoping to do six crawls in 2013. This year, we're, we should have two done in 2012. Uh, we're not as frequent as Google or Bing or anything like that, but we're a lot more frequent than, say, Clue Web, for those of you from the information retrieval community. And we're hoping to increase the frequency. We're also, in 2013, planning on adding targeted subset crawls that will be happening very frequently on the order of once a week or maybe once a month, something, a subset of very high interest that's much smaller and can be accomplished faster. Okay, so I think we have, um, I really want to get to Ravi, so yep. we'll maybe have other questions at the end. Thanks. Thanks, man. This data, um, I was playing with it the other day. I pulled down the million song data set. Uh, I parsed it with just a simple queue-based um, uh, approach using some Ruby, uh, parsed out all the artist names, and then I queried the entire of the web to see where those artist names co-occurred on web pages. Then I built up a ginormous graph of how all these uh, artists related to each other and built like a big family tree, uh, just for fun. But it did show me that there is a sort of musical uh, royalty at the top to which almost everybody is compared to, Elvis and Madonna, so there you go. Um, so uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is that all of that was done for, I think there's less than 200 lines of code uh, in all of that, and I was able to run it uh, more or less in about four hours, I think. Uh, so it was, a, it was a, a very interesting way to navigate a couple of different data sets. So uh, on that point, I want to introduce uh, Ravi Maduri, uh, who's gonna talk a little bit about how you can orchestrate and move your data sets around. Ravi, thanks. Hey, thanks. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? All right, um, so my name is Ravi Maduri. Thanks, thanks Matt, for, for, for this opportunity. Um, so I'm a, I work at the University of Chicago, Argonne National Laboratory, and, and various other institutions. Uh, um, uh, I come from land of big iron. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a, I work at a DOE lab. So, so these are the kind of machines that, that we have at our disposal. We have a, a big blue jean. Uh, uh, which is one of the top 10 uh, super fast computers uh, in the world right now. Uh, it's 10 petaflops. So we have, um, I have accounts on all of these machines. So we have two, cray, two crays that I have accounts on, one at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, one at Argonne, one at um, one IBM Dataplex, uh, again at Berkeley, and one petascale active data storage system. So we do have a lot of compute and a lot of storage, as you can see. So why I'm here, right? So this is a cloud computing conference. What am I doing here? Uh, actually, it's pretty interesting. So, so I have two, two interesting, actually three, uh, three interesting projects that I'm working on that, that made me uh, kind of look at Amazon and, and you know, a light bulb uh, uh, went on, went off. And, and I'm, I was really happy that, um, that I had this opportunity to show you. Uh, so I wanted to kind of start with, uh, with this code. Um, uh, this is, um, uh, I mean, I, don't, I haven't heard about this guy before my boss showed me the slide. But uh, one of the things that, you know, civilization advances um, by extending the number of operations that you can do without thinking. This is a big, uh, uh, big code. And, and, and one of the reasons why um, we people, we do a lot of things uh, today, uh, we don't actually have to think about them. And uh, what we do at the University of Chicago and Computation Institute is that we're trying to apply um, the, the, the essence of this code uh, to scientific data management. 
right? So, uh, so you'll see a lot of things that Matt talked about uh, uh, kind of reflect in some of my slides, uh, both in terms of reproducibility of research and, and uh, how you can make um, uh, research data management much more easier and flexible. Uh, at some level, uh, I'm, so just, just like Lisa, you know, I'm really passionate about what I'm doing, right? Because uh, I'm not really working on um, showing the right ad in the 20 microseconds you have before the user can wander off his gaze. We're actually trying to advance a civilization, right? We're trying to do things. Uh, we're trying to, uh, we're working with researchers trying to find the cure for cancer and other things. Um, so. Um, so well, this is a sort of a uh, list of tasks that people do in scientific research today. Uh, these are the time-consuming tasks when you, you know, uh, in order to do scientific research, you run experiments, you collect data, you manage data, you acquire computers, you, I mean, anybody who's been in the scientific research enterprise for longer know that the science, science uh, has become computational. So if you're, take a pick of your favorite scientific discipline, and see what's going on in the scientific discipline. It's all about computation. So as you can see, a lot of these tasks are about doing data management, right? And what we did, um, what we want to do, and what we're trying to do, and what we are running this experiment on is to what would happen if you outsource all the data management activities from the researchers? Uh, the reason, because your traditional, comp your traditional bioinformaticians are biologists, our uh, chemistry researchers, they're not really IT people, or they're not, they're not really computer scientists. So, but what do they do? They spend a lot of time on these data management activities, and, and they spend, uh, correspondingly, the amount of time they spend on doing actual science goes down. So what we are trying to do at University of Chicago is we're trying to outsource the data management. So how, how would, what would it look like if you, if you provide research IT as a service? What would that mean? What would, how, how would that affect the researchers and how would that make them more efficient and do what they do really good? Um, so, oops, this is really. So one of the things that we, okay. Right, so, so you can see that um, this is how we see science getting done. So I kind of had some representative science uh, experiments there. There's a big telescope that's going online uh, in, a, in a few months, um, and there's, a, uh, there's a genome sequencing, uh, as, you can, as you probably already know. The amount of data that's generated by these sequencing machines is growing exponentially. And there are, there are a lot of uh, supercomputers uh, that are generating a lot of data on simulations. So uh, I'll probably talk about one of, uh, uh, I'll take one, e one of those use cases and talk a little bit more. As you can see, uh, each of these uh, processes have, uh, have these multiple data management activities that go in, in that. Uh, they do staging of data, they do ingest, they do uh, analysis, and, and, and then finally they archive it and, and for, for, uh, for, for future. So the go our goal is to sort of accelerate discovery um, and innovation by outsourcing the mundane stuff that people, that researchers have to do in their, in their daily, uh, in their, in, in, every day. Um, so one of the things that we did initially is to pick data movement as, as, a, as our first challenge that we want to attack. Um, because um, a, a typical scientific endeavor kind of becomes uh, moving data from where the data is available to where compute is, just uh, what uh, Matt was talking about, about the 1,000 genome data set. Um, so what we did was uh, we took data movement and we created a service out of it. Uh, uh, called and call it Globus Online, which is uh, sort of a Globus Online is a data movement as a service. It provides a secure, automatic, reliable, high-speed data movement uh, across uh, multiple Globus Online endpoints. So if you are actually, if you are using Amazon today to do your compute, uh, you should definitely look at Globus Online to move your data from, from where it is available to Amazon to get, uh, to get analysis done. Um, as you can see, so this is, uh, if you go to globusonline.org, globusonline you'll see a counter. Um, that's the counter that, uh, that we kind of programmed it to, uh, to talk about the number of, uh, uh, data, uh, the number of bytes of data that has been moved. So it's close to 8.5 petabytes now. Uh, the, the service has launched um, uh, two years ago, and we already got 7,500 users and, and people moving data very reliably. Um, so this is sort of... Uh, 
and, and one thing, the reason I, I kind of talked about this data service is this service is entirely based on Amazon Web Services. So we built it completely using various components of Amazon uh, AWS, and, and we're pretty happy to report that our site, our globusonline.org is 99.9% point nine percent available except when we when we have things that we need to fix um, so so far the service has moved 500 uh, 500 millions of files uh, for a lot of different scientific uh, scientific groups um, so I, I have some examples um, so Katrin Heitman she's a collaborator of mine uh, she moved uh, close to 22 terabytes of data and this is an interesting uh, so what what Katrin and, and her uh, her team does uh, is, uh, is they're building a simulator for cosmology, okay? What that means is that uh, uh, they take a visible universe. Uh, actually, t let me take a step back. They, they get time from a supercomputer, and they start with, uh, with two billion particles, and they run a simulation uh, for a few days on the supercomputer. And then they create a, a universe in the supercomputer, and then they map it, they match it with the existing universe, and then they run the simulation again to make the simulator better. So at some level, they're sort of creating universes in, in, in the supercomputer. But what happens after they generate the level zero data is that they want to make it available to everybody, every cosmologist in the world, to do their own analysis to make the simulation better. So one other thing they, do, they did was they used uh, Globus Online to move the data from one of the supercomputers to, to where they can make it available for other people. So there are other examples of, uh, of these people who are moving large amounts of data using Globus Online. Um, so we know we've done a really good job with data movement, but, uh, but we didn't want to stop there. Because as I talked about before, uh, scientific endeavor, scientific research requires a lot of other components that are more than uh, just data movement. As you can see, there's, uh, uh, there's ingest catalog integration, kind of trying to find the right data sets that you're looking for sharing, collaboration, and annotating data sets, identity, group management, and security. These are all really important when you want to share your data sets with other people. Uh, the reason I say it is you know, I have a background working with high-energy physicists who are really careful of sharing their data. And you ask them why, they say, well, there might be a Nobel Prize in it. I don't want to share it with 10 other people. So it's very important to kind of have a really good solution to, do manage, to manage identity and security. And analysis and simulation visualization. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, analysis uh, in two use cases that I wanted to talk here. So Matt kind of, uh, I'll just run this simulation through. Um, so Matt talked about genome sequencing analysis. Right now, there are a lot of genome sequencing centers um, in, the, in the world. And the favorite may, way of transferring data is using FedEx. Um, because uh, as Matt said, it's high bandwidth, but uh, very bad latency. The, the other problem with FedEx is also that some drives can go bad during the transit, and it's, it just gets into an interesting situation. So what we did with our Globus Online solution is that uh, we connected all, this, um, all the Broad Institute and other sequence centers uh, as Globus Online endpoints, and, and we made it really easy for researchers who are doing uh, drug discovery and other sorts of analysis to, tra to move data from the sequence centers to Amazon. And then we provided a managed platform on Amazon uh, using a framework called Galaxy uh, to make it easy to run this analysis uh, at scale on Amazon. So at some level, we're trying to automate all of these tasks for researchers so they don't have to do, uh, do it themselves. Um, I was at, uh, at a biology conference recently, and uh, one of the PIs gave, uh, went up and, and gave a talk. She said, you know, my postdocs keeps talking to me about these keys. You know, I don't know what keys he's talking about. And then I, she later realized that he didn't actually mean physical keys. He was actually talking about Amazon keys. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, I mean the, the researcher is really good at what she does. She doesn't need to know what Amazon keys is all about. So that's where we are trying to uh, fill the gap between you know, providing a service that the researcher focuses on the science and outsources the mundane activities of, uh, of the scientific endeavor to, to services like us. Um, so we, we run this Galaxy on, on Amazon, and we run it at scale. Um, one of the, the other interesting thing I want to talk to you about is that um, I work with type 2 diabetes researchers. Um, and um, um, they, they've been acquiring a lot of data sets from different families who are affected by type 2 diabetes. 
right? One of the things uh, this postdoc at a, at a lab told me is that, you know, we're probably sitting on two or three nature papers. Uh, nature is a, is a big uh, publication uh, uh, venue. Uh, but we don't know because we can't really analyze all this data. Uh, and that's, that's actually affecting all of you here, right? At some level, the, the researchers are, are not being able to do their job because they're being stifled by, uh, be it uh, the campus computing resources are not adequate or they don't know the know-how up to how to get this, run, uh, get this analysis run at scale. So that's where we're trying to focus on making it really easy for researchers like that to do their work. Uh, this is other uh, use case that, uh, this is other project that, uh, that we worked with Amazon on. Uh, is to um, rebuild um, uh, proton. So the pr proton cancer therapy is, a, is getting very popular in, in treating different types of cancer. So one of the uh, challenges in the, in the therapy is that the patient comes into the treatment plant and they have to wait a day before, the, um, before his tumor can be, uh, can be uh, create an image and reconstructed and analyzed. So what we did with that is that um, we took the... Uh, uh, they call them histories. Um, we took two, 2.1 billions of billion particle traces from this proton treatment plant, and we ran them on Amazon to do the image reconstruction using Amazon uh, GPUs. And we were able to get that number of uh, uh, the time it takes to reconstruct an image to 11 minutes. So I can give you more details about why that is important. Um, but uh, I'll probably you know, take more time than, uh, than I can. The other things that, uh, that I do, uh, that, that we do as a team, is you know, we have, uh, we're doing something very similar to cardiovascular research analysis uh, uh, for ECG analysis at scale. Uh, we also have a service that provides uh, proteomics analysis on, 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 um, at scale, too. Um, so if you want more information, um, come and talk to me after the talk. And you know, at some level, our goal is to, to accelerate discovery and innovation worldwide by making, it, by making research IT available as a service. And, and we're leveraging Amazon at every given point um, and to make it possible to, to make this research IT available as a service. So um, the goal is to accelerate the rate at which the scientific discovery happens, right? And the way that, and the way we are trying to make that happen is to use appropriate computational techniques and making research IT available as a service so researchers can focus on what they're good at rather than figuring out how to do, uh, how to do IT. So I, we got uh, some funding from, from DOD, NIH, and, and Amazon has been really kind to give us some uh, educational grants uh, so we could bootstrap some of these efforts and show value to, to the researchers and, and, um, and, uh, and continue our work. Uh, I have a lot of people at U Chicago and Oregon that I work with who, who did a lot of the work that I'm presenting here, and that should be. Thank you. All right, fantastic. So I think um, we sort of gone through uh, some really ex exceptionally interesting areas here and talked a little bit about how data is accelerating the state of the art, accelerating the state of science. Um, if you have uh, any interest in this area, please do drop me an email. I'm matthew at amazon.com. Um, if you have data sets you'd like to make available, uh, please do let me know. If you have more interest in the education grants program that Ravi mentioned, uh, then please do get in touch as well. Um, with that, I'd like to wrap up. If you have any questions, then I'll hang around for a few extra minutes along with the rest of my speakers. Thanks a lot. <laughs>